to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Our guest today is Jared Durrell, a student at St. Thomas University in journalism. So welcome, Jared. Hey, Dennis. It's good to be here. So to start us off, um, it'll be a tough for context, but what's it like being a student nowadays? We often get it from the media where they'll tell us what students are living uh, through or like, and it'll be a hot issue, but they don't in general capture what's it like these days to go to university. It's really tricky, especially, uh, like, I mean, that's sort of this belief that university should be hard for everyone. It's like a rite of passage. It's an artificial puberty. You go in and you're expected to come out an adult afterwards, but a lot of the time you're not an adult going in or you're still on the cusp of it. And then there's other people who are, they're coming in and you're like, I got this. I can handle the world on my shoulders because I've already been off the toughest part of it. And so you're kind of missing a bit of it. I'm closer to that. It's like I was ready to take on the world. So I'm just finishing up my second year, so I'm exactly halfway. But it's tricky because everyone comes down from a different background, so I'm not going to even pretend to comprehend or speak for what other people are going through. But from the experience, especially from Fredericton's universities and living in New Brunswick, it's all about management of time, commitment, and seeing how you can grow from that well, finding and clutching at straws for the best support networks you can build. So it's like nesting, and then hoping that you can fly away afterwards. As we were uh, prepping to do the show, you were sharing a story about um, one of your schoolmates who was homeless for half a year. A lot of people on the outside not being part of school, so I'm generalizing people 35 to 55 years of age, remembering university a certain way. They really struggle with understanding the food insecurity or the housing insecurity or the financial circumstances of today's students, or some of today's students. That's a big thing too. Is uh, So I have a friend, um, he was homeless during the first semester because of uh, complications with renting at a place and then the lease fell through and then having to leave it. So uh, being evicted, not really having any support network to catch him. He uh, was homeless and still kept going to classes, so I'd see him sporadically week by week. And I didn't know him uh, personally really well until he's sitting by me one day and we start just shooting the shit and talking. And he mentions it, and then he kind of, after mentioning it, introducing it, it goes past that, and he, he starts sharing like where he's at emotionally and what he needs and what he, he doesn't think he's going to be able to stay and finish the semester. And I'm looking at this kid that I barely know, but he's supposed to be my age and he's going through something that my older sister and older brother have gone through. And I'm just looking at him like, holy crap, man, I wouldn't even be here. If that came up with me, I would put pause on everything. And so he ended up uh, missing a lot more classes and then the prof asked about him and I made a decision and I went to the professor privately who I know fairly well. Uh, and I mentioned it, I explained it, uh, this guy needs a break. He's not going to tell you he needs a break, but he needs help right now. Uh, so I did that, and I felt real bad about it for a long time. Hmm. And then uh, my friend shows up again. I nearly just said his name, but my friend shows up again to classes, and he looks at me, and I think he's going to be pissed, but he's like, hey, man, uh, I wasn't going to do it myself, so I just want to say thank you. And I was like, I, I feel proud, but also like, holy crap, how are you doing? So I immediately break it down. <laughs> he's got a new place. He's taking care of himself and he's living. Uh, and then he comes back for the second semester and now he's just floating, which is good. But it's like that is sometimes stuff comes up and it really tries you to see if you will remain. Like I've met students who live uh, in the area, in Fredericton, but because of like the complications of it and the stress that they hit, and they could have been a great student, is they'll bottom out. Is It will wear down at them and then it gets into this like isolation thing. So when I lived in residence uh, and I was told going into it, it's 13 weeks, it's going to be fine. A semester is going to fly by. And that's right, it does fly by. But it's like going at full speed and those signs are hitting you right in the head and you want to still read them. So there's kids getting hit in the head and they're so concussed that they end up spiraling down. Yeah. And when they do that, you can tell. You can tell who's going to drop out because immediately they'll... It's not the not showing up to class or the not talking to a prof. It's the eyes down, um, halfway interest in things. They start really spreading out over everything. And it's like watching someone go from being like a 
a human being into like melting down like a candle and that wax gets everywhere and when it's that brittle you're just waiting for something to break it and when that breaks they're gone and when they're gone you don't hear a word of it they just move out it's not like this bon voyage farewell good luck it's shameful um, it's someone who disappears and goes away but I've been used to that so going to university I was like oh that's what that is so you've just painted for us a very different image of what compared to what media will do or movies will do about the university experience there's a thinness there there's also a kind of a lack of joy you know because learning is supposed to be dynamic and fun and it tends to be high energy and you're passionate and you know that ideal version of what learning is and what you just described is a series of um like work challenges almost and the, the joy isn't part of it <laughs> Not at all. That's uh, very much what everyone's dealing with in education now is they want to make it engaging and entertaining and make sure everyone can have that kind of like dead poet society moment where they really entertain the concepts independently and can be their own um, Nietzschean Superman where they've got like they can carry a burden, they can direct themselves, they can appreciate all as sensible aspects of life. But that's not the reality of trying to meet a ridiculous amount of work to keep a GPA. So the profs can do whatever they want. They could be as engaging as, they, as crack cocaine. They could be as entertaining as the Super Bowl. But they're not going to be able to deliver on that without understanding the like, rigors of going from one class to another, maintaining all the assignments uh, to then get this cumulative marking point that's going to represent you so you can get on a list, get into some little section where you're more safe and secure. So it's like going to a big field and you've got a bunch of people entertaining, inviting, and beautiful concepts. But at the end of the day, you're still waiting for the sun to go down and find a good place to sleep so you can wake up the next day and go a little bit further until you get to the place you're going for. And some of those professors will go with you. Some of those professors will carry you the whole way. They're amazingly engaged. Some of them can't. They're dealing with their own things. Some are research professors. Some are able to give you the best lessons and lectures in one concept but not deal with you socially because they just aren't emotionally intelligent. Their emotional intelligence quotient is zero and it shows. But that's not personal. Nothing is personal, which is another issue, is when you're going through that and you're making friends, is they've got that same thinness. So the lack of joy is a shared thing and people do crazy things to try and get that joy back. That's why there's so much attendance of bars uh, and stimulants and stuff like that to try and like keep this idea of happiness by just triggering the body into thinking it's happy rather than an engaged experience where you slowly build like effort into happiness but you can't do that because you're so worried about the next test the next quiz the next essay and all that and proofing it and rather than actually learning the proper logic behind grammar and punctuation learning to be afraid of failing yeah can you give us a picture of what the typical workload's like? If yours is an example, You're, you might be a bit more the exception, but people tend to think, you know, uh, four or five courses, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, two hours each, but they don't fully appreciate the, the total volume of the workload. They'll just kind of see a schedule. They won't see what happens off the schedule. So I usually wake up at five o'clock or eight o'clock. Uh, I get ready, I make eggs or bacon, I have to check the mailbox because uh, we're on the early side of the mail route which is really interesting but uh, going from that it's pack everything get it ready um, so I've got a house that I live in uh, and I got to take care of that especially recently uh, with ice shelving which is when yeah. you've got our overfills and you've got as a asphalt roof with the shingles going down it and then uh, when ice builds up, it starts seeping through because the bottom layer melts the first yeah. and the top layer kind of keeps that cooling. So, But your school workload though. So okay, I'll get to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I that's part of your day. Exactly. <laughs> but well, the reason why I mention it is because everyone's coming from somewhere to get to that class. See, I haven't even gotten to class yet and I'm already engaged with all those problems of the day. And that's human. That's this thing we live in and I'm not going to ask for pity on that, but it's the mindfulness that's missing. So I'll deal with that, and then I got out of class, and I'm sitting around a bunch of people who are all dealing with their own thing. Buddy to the left, his gas tank just exploded, so he's got to go take it and fix it. You, you've had that? 
No, but I can picture it though. Yeah, that's actually what happened to a friend of mine. Is we were um, we were hanging out and his gas tank started leaking, and I was like, "Yeah, that's a leak." And so he's got to go handle that, and he makes barely enough money to cover it. And then the person to the right of me, uh, say she's dealing with an assault that happened over the weekend. A close friend went to the bar to have fun, and then got exploited and abused, and is now trying to find truth in that. And then the person in front of me is a trans individual who's now depressed because the government of the province is not appreciating the fact that they need help. They need a special kind of help. Then the person behind me is coming in from the greatest weekend ever where him and the boys cracked some cold ones, shouted on the streets, had a good St. Paddy's Day, but is totally buzzed and not at all engaged in the class because he's really covering up the fact that he's scared he's not going to be able to play sports next year. It's all that. And so the workload hits, and you'll get a syllabus. And the most powerful thing a student can do is break down their syllabus and plot it onto a calendar to know those dates and use it as a roadmap. So that's what I was taught to do by my mom. And I can break it down. And so right now I've got uh, three assignments to finish up. Uh, I've got to uh, make sure I'm ready for my midterm on Wednesday, make sure I'm ready for my final exams, which come in April, uh, make sure I've applied to my student loan and registered for my courses. And those are all dates to hit and be prepared for those days. But you never know what's going to come up on the days in between. And that's okay. That's life. But it's just something that's not appreciated enough is life gets in the way. So how many courses do you take this semester? I took uh, four. Uh, I took five this semester. I've taken overload the previous semester, which is when you take a sixth. And when you take uh, overload, it's not always bad if you can manage courses that are interdisciplinary. So you take a sociology, and then a cultural anthropology. It works uh, if your brain lets it, or if the assignments stack up. So if you have a bunch of tests in class for both courses, it's fine. You just show up and make sure you've read the material. But if you got a lot of take-home readings in one and a lot of take-home readings in other, that's when you start mixing them, when they start messing you up because you'll be like, this concept was on this page, but that's actually the wrong book. Yeah. It's like learning five dance steps. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't sort them out after a while. The, uh, and how much away from class work would you guesstimate you have? So say a class takes you three to five hours a week. Uh, away from class, you'd have, I don't know, another five hours... The way they assign you the work away from class. Yeah, um, that's the thing too though, is you have to manage how much time you can commit to it. And sometimes projects don't get finished, especially with project management. You don't really have, I really don't have an office space. Some students might. Yeah. So like I'll commit three hours to a paper and then end up having to go deal with some other crazy situation, then come back to it and scrap it and start over. So I'll have six hours for the final paper, but three hours only on the final version of it. Uh, and then research, studying, getting the sources. Uh, for say, histography, um, a history project, like you have to do an assessment or write a thesis entertaining the idea that from this point in history to this point, there was some significant change and here's why. So you have to go out and get your sources and that's gonna take about maybe 15 hours. So just hard source finding, uh, which is, maybe five hours at the library, five hours to read the source completely, um, and then another five hours to select which sources you cut and what parts you want. Then it's going to take you to the actual essay or uh, the thesis or the paper or the doctor, whatever project you're working on because there's a lot of levels of uh, varying intensity. And what that preps you for is you have to break it down and then build a skeleton where you want to make your statement, the supporting arguments, the counter arguments, acknowledge all aspects of it, and the results. Then you take those results, you edit it, and you finally proof it, and you make sure it's ready for the deadline. So it's like this beautiful craft, like making a table. You got to piece, uh, pick the tree, pick how you're going to do it, design it, and then intimately work on it until you're going absolutely mad and need to disengage. And then coming back to it, putting the varnish on and getting out the door. And that's a great romantic view of it. But sometimes you can't have that amount of time commitment. So it's better to get it done than get it perfect. But like I said, there's a great anxiety to not having it perfect. Because managing that's crazy. It can do awful things to people and make them on edge and have such a thinness that when it's breached, they'll react in like abnormally a social ways where they have to isolate and try to readjust.
in tie to all that, because the culmination of that whole process you just mapped out for us, is that it all ties to a GPA, or a grade point average, which gets into a certain arbitrariness or abstractness to assign a value of one, two, three, or four to all that work you just described. So it, it's a tough sledding to get to your final product, and then when you let it go, um, you're not sure what's going to come back. Well, it's this concept of completeness and being graded on your completeness, which is harsh because it doesn't really appreciate the complete struggle of one person. So you'll get, and that's the whole issue with university, is it tries to create these engaged, educated, and activated people and persons that can make a change and make a difference in whatever aspect they want to live in, especially with a liberal arts uh, school where you intimately get to study and pursue things for the aspect of study and pursuit from a totally objective but also sensible and it's like trying to break it down because uh, there's technical schools in different universities so UNB has a bunch of faculties and it's a very streamlined process and it super engages students that way so that's why it has a lot of clout and a lot of attracted students go there to just engage in one program and get that goal. Liberal arts, it wants that interdisciplinary. It wants to sensitize people to things they weren't aware of and kind of build that framework so they can be more enabled to work on their own framework and then take a framework and make it work with another. So it's more modular. It's like being able to take apart a toaster and find the parts for a watch. And then UNB, especially with a lot of their streamlined programs, and that's just the way education works, is once you've entertained a field and intimately know it, you go into a more focused version of it, and more focused and more focused, and the blinders get on, and you're so engaged in that one topic, you could talk about it from every aspect, except for what created that topic, and sometimes they can. So, to say it quaintly, when you take an arts degree and you're told that this GPA is going to reflect how well you did and it's going to appreciate that aspect of you completing coursework rather than your engagement, how you're able to use the outcomes, how you're able to um, prove it, how you're able to replicate it, how well it was demonstrated to you. That's a fundamental of education is the demonstration, imitation, replication of any concept, no matter what you're doing. The GPA doesn't do that. The GPA trusts that every other system before it reflects all those things properly. And sometimes that just doesn't happen. The um, two things to continue exploring in post-secondary education, and then we'll switch theme or topic, is that okay? Yep. Um, <clears throat> one is, within universities, um, it's not a struggle, but there's a, a more challenging conversation to be had about um, hiring practices and the talent pool of instructors, teachers, professors, etc. So St. Thomas, um, not just self in Canadian history, is the first university ever to lock out the professors. That was uh, about 10 years or so ago. And um, in that conversation that rolled out after that point in time was uh, so many tenured professors so many assistants and in so many on the subject by subject uh, contract and it was really tough to talk about um, one being better than the other because media tended to pit them against each other but there is something to be said about uh, when a post-secondary institution starts hiring on contract basis for teaching a course and a course and a course because it saves them money the impact that that has on the student for working with an instructor who doesn't have a long-term or stable work situation and how they interact with students compared to the tenured professor who knows that they've got stability, knows that they can commit long-term to a relationship and um, nurture the student along that way and also the culture of the school that way. Does that kind of make sense? Have you ex oh, yeah, experienced, oh, yeah. you know, there's a difference in the teaching it without it being a personal knock, yeah. you know, because they don't have the long-term commitment because they're trying to get on with their career somewhere because I'm here for one contract for two courses at 5000 a course. Exactly. So to simplify uh, 
before I even get into it, there's a lot of differences between different, that's why there's whole terms for different profs. There's research profs who you know are there to sell research, they're gonna write a book. It's gonna be the history of food from one perspective and they're gonna put it into a pile and hopefully that pile gets picked up by a publisher that can sell it to chapters and then they can make money through syndication and royalties and being invited places. Or they're a research prof that entertains these big concepts and they wanna go work at the archives all day and they're just there because the university's the way in. And the university trusts them and is going to put them in charge of a class because they can see some version of that. Now, especially with the Atlantic um, province, the Maritimes, and uh, the review boards they have for professors, is all faculties have to be approved by this non-university board before being created out of school. And so they kind of make a contract about that. And when they make that contract, usually there's a professor or a set of professors in mind. Uh, for example, at STU, there's a Native Studies department where there's only one full-time professor right now, uh, and then there's one part-time, and the former head just retired. Now, it's such a small uh, but influential group because when you only have two professors working a whole curriculum for students that want to pursue that as their major, right? because when you go into a degree, you have to declare a major, your focus that you're going to develop, and then you can take that as a, a merit or a badge that can be applied to someone who can be like, I understand that you might know about these concepts and now I trust you and I'm going to let you come in for the job interview. Rather than entertaining a philosophy student going in to talk about why they can practice legal ease, they want a law student going into law because it's this, it's like that toy everyone had when they were a kid where they take a shape and they put it in that hole. Now professors who are like that, they only deal with students that are in that hole. So I have seen fine arts professors who behave in a certain way because they have tenure, because they know they are allowed to do that. They're permitted. They've passed that barrier that they treat all students in a way that they want to entertain. And sometimes that's beneficial because it can push a student for success. Sometimes it will just strip a student of their dignity because they're dealing with things outside of that professor's classroom. So a lot of tenured professors aren't, aren't very mindful, especially because it's more of their world. And then a lot of research professors, more disengaged, less emotional intelligence, less stuff like that. But those are generalizations of mm -hmm. people. So mm -hmm. I can't go into it any further without starting to get into that personal knox. Yeah, but it gives an outsider a peek into the quality of life and experience of a student today, which mainstream media often will categorize as oh, tuition went up 3%. But they don't factor in the cost of food, the cost of gas, the cost of living, and all the other stresses in a typical day. Especially the failures of certain programs for supporting students. We didn't even get into food insecurity where students are now buying more groceries while still dealing with a really fixed income. A lot of the time, uh, just depending on students too, some go in with their loans and that's their, that is their parachute that they're slowly picking away at or cutting certain strings to tie something else up. It's this concept of having only this much resources and trying to manage it over a long term. And then there's other students that are coming in with capital investments and bank accounts that are able to securely invest into a better future. And then there's other students who are coming at it from breaking the bank on tuition and because they don't have the support networks, because they haven't hit in the province's merits or the scholarship's merits or the grant's merits. All, what I'm talking about now is merits. It's the permission of one person accepting or appreciating uh, someone's struggle or what they can provide or produce or what they represent. So it goes back to GPA. Is The media has a meritocracy of what it means to be a student. The GPA has a meritocracy of what it means to be a successful student. Students have a meritocracy of what it means to be engaged in a classroom and succeeding. And what that merit system has kind of done is because it's not appreciative of all aspects of the circle is it only looks at how someone can benefit from telling that story. So yeah, the media's failed of course because they have to get people to read it. And a lot of the times it's not going to break down what investment portfolio UNBs developed this year and how that impacts you because they're now investing in, for example, and this could be true or not true, <laughs> a company that manufactures bullets like SNC Avalan or how they invested into this to secure some long-term commitment to Irving who in turn commits a bunch more money to this department like the Canadian Rivers Associ uh, Institute or Association. Yeah. 
Institute, who in turn are now working for the Irvings after the Irvings have been responsible for the impacts on the river. It's this fundamental cycle of privileged people doing privileged things while disengaging but still allowing certain merited individuals in. For every one student university, there's a hundred that they've climbed over from public school. And that's the issue with post-secondary education. And that, <coughs> I could get on about that a bit longer, but that's just another thing that's not been covered or looked into, is there's insecurity every way stepping up, but that becomes, that's because it comes from an unfair system. The, and I really appreciate that. Is there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of socioeconomic backgrounds. The fact that uh, a homeless student was able to say, sustain himself in St. Thomas University with very little assistance is amazing. It's more about that student than it is the university. But it's still a space where that happened. So there's something to it. Uh, the failures, the amount of intensity of students going in uh, from working at the universities, uh, the middle ground, the no man's land in between both campuses, the sub I've seen and been engaged with a lot of students, and the amount of UNB students that drop out or bottom out is more intense, but that's because it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall to see if it's cooked, it is the pieces you're sacrificing are just to see if something works or if it doesn't work. And it's four years that they're expecting most students to be there. So it's a four year investment. And it's handled by those administrators and those finances people in such an aspect that they're disengaged because they're worried about that bottom line. So the money talks. When we started this tack, or this direction of the conversation, um, you talked about um, uh, rituals or rites of passage. And what you've just described is very brutal version of that rite of passage where young persons kind of on their own when they go to school have these variety of challenges coming at them and at the same time have to develop the skill sets that they actually needed beforehand <laughs> to deal with those challenges. So in a dark way or in a shadow world way, the university seems to have evolved as a rite of passage that's very intense and has nothing to do with formal education as opposed to coping with financial pressures, housing pressures, food pressures, um, sense of well-being pressures, all going through all those transitions. So it crosses my mind, wouldn't it be interesting if universities integrated a kind of a cultural component or a nurturing component that allowed um, that rite of passage to happen in a more um, I want to say almost gentle way or a more compassionate way. And there's a lot of programs going on for that in some aspect. Like one is looking at solving the housing problem by having uh, seniors live with students. Is someone who's already isolated because of some circumstances they can't control living with someone who's entertaining this fake puberty concept of trying to struggle and seeing how that can balance itself out. So that's one attempt. Then another attempt is uh, peer support centers where it's like a bunch of information, a bunch of people that are there to support someone who comes into the space. And it's there, those are pathways that are being developed. There's uh, food banks, there's um, sexual assault support centers, there's uh, gender queer representational groups, uh, then there's uh, groups for indigenous students, and then there's groups for multicultural students. It's, it's all about like intersectionality, but then there's the student union who funds all this who controls how much money goes to which department. And that student union is just like the Board of Governors for the university, where it's a group of people who are fundamentally concerned about the budget and looking good, walking away from the project. And they don't engage with these groups on a level that they should. So the capacity to listen isn't being used. The capacity to communicate, to tell applicable stories and hear how you can fix someone's life by giving them this or what they need and managing the resources isn't being done. Last year what we saw uh, was tuition was going up at UNB. It was unprecedented compared to a lot of others, but that was because they fundamentally wanted to fix the deficit they were running. Then there's a bunch of challenges as to what created that deficit and better means to s solve it. That wasn't heard. The protests weren't even held in their full capacity because the authority that was used was so disproportionate that it became more of a concept of we're going to wait, we're going to shut you out and now you're going to either go back to classes 
or in three years' time, it's not going to affect you anyways. Because a lot of the students that were protesting were grad students. So say someone goes into this fake puberty, and they have to stress themselves so much, and then they graduate. It's done. It's over. They don't want to be re-traumatized by engaging with university anymore. And a lot of times they can't find a job right after anyways. So going back to it, yeah, there's some form of support. There's some form of feasibility going out of it now or that wants to be built from the inside out. But those students leave and those programs die. And when those programs die, they're not maintained. They become a file that sits somewhere and is cut, rather than being something that students are made aware of going in, or uh, showing off how difficult it's going to be to be a student and what's going to be there to save you. That's not done either. And that needs to be done. That's the more ethical and engaged way to do it. Yeah. So let's wander into some other themes and okay. see, because um, you've plugged yourself in as a journalism student into a, a fairly big circle. Uh, from politics to environmental stuff to um, First Nations world and it's like you live in the gaps and so uh, as such you're able to move through all these different worlds as opposed to you're trying to focus on just one. So can we explore a little bit your your take on New, Run New Brunswick's politics right now and the fact we've got a minority government for the first time in a hundred years and and what your hope for that might be? Oh, well, that I'm going to identify because this is what people need because that's the society we live in. My merit to it. This is my world. I'm Jared Durrell. I come from a family in Bay St. Anne. My great uncle is Yvonne Durrell. My grandfather is Rene Durrell. I'm a French Mi'kmaq person. I live in this space. I have a history in this space. I'm committed to this space. With a minority government, I only know so much about it because I am a student. I know most of my political information from Sadly, Brunswick News, uh, from the fact that it was everywhere growing up, especially, is there's no level of understanding, and I'll get to that in a second, is I'm getting information from a source that I don't fully understand how much impact it has. And then I was engaged in public school, which, again, is being a student in a place that I fully don't understand the limits of. Then I become a university student, so I've hit through those stages that have been set up for me, for what justifies my level of engagement. But outside of that, I've been working. I've been working for food banks. I've been uh, working for farming co-ops. I've been working for pawn shops. I've been working at McDonald's. I've done the full trek and back of part-time jobs and full-time jobs, Sobeys Warehouse, to everywhere. All that struggle, all that strife to get me through those steps. So when I get to university and I'm pegged as a journalism student, I always laugh because it, it's almost like saying, that person's potentially going to go somewhere. When I've already been somewhere, I'm Jared Durrell and I live for that because I had to even picking my name after being denied it was tricky. So I come from an abusive household and my legal name is Jared Nathan Anthony Den Hollander. And after taking my father to court and having to deal with the impacts of a cycle of violence and abuse, is I disengaged and I went for a name change and I dropped the two worst parts of it so now it's Jared Anthony Durrell and I've been going with that and I've got it changed and that was an amazing thing to do I did all that over a lifetime yep. I'm only 19 and I came from a long set of circumstances so when I come into politics yeah uh, I've got my own things that I think should be done but also I represent a result of this province, an accumulative thing that's been developed. No matter what, this space, this system, I'm also a product of it, but I'm engaged in it. So I live in some of the cracks, but that's only because those cracks have been developed by disconnects. And those disconnects only exist because a lot of people who aren't engaged to the province get to develop things, or they're engaged to one aspect of the province. So selfishly, it grows that way. And when it grows that way, other people adjust. So the current minority government is great to me, because it's from a disconnected, dysfunctional family. That's what I come from. I can deal with that. I can deal with fighting and conflict any day. What I can't deal with is when someone tries to take that and grow so much that they inflate it and start directing with it. So what I'm referring to right now is the fact that the minority government was established with uh, primarily 
uh, all PC uh, cabinet, which is fundamentally the rights of the elected uh, leader of the government. So that's more political information than someone wants to even deal with in the day. But what we're seeing is someone shows up and they're going to be initially invested in how they look representing a bunch of fighting people. And that's not fair because that's not what they're elected to do. No one was elected to be the referee. And when someone gets to entertain the concept of being the referee, that's unfair because immediately they're going to look like more of an authority and more responsible for the good things that happen rather than being seen as someone that possibly could be corrupt in the fact that they don't handle finances in the best way that they should have or someone that showed up and fought to be there. They're seen as someone that's a fixture of it. And that kind of respect, it's deserved in part, but it shouldn't be appreciated in full. It should be challenged. And a lot of these things should be challenged. Policy needs to be challenged for it to grow. If there's been some marginalized group that keeps getting beat up because of a bad policy, then you need to change that policy. But you need to hear from the people who are being beat up by that policy. And that's not being done either. So we've got new, more of a cabinet than ever before to manage any damage that's done uh, and damage being good or bad. Uh, damage to the budget, meaning some success in some aspect or some promise for a project to succeed, or damage to the idea that we're living in a functional province. We've never been living in a functional province. Historically, that's not what this is. It's a challenge and it's attempt to make something happen. Um, there's always, especially in this province, from the Acadians arriving, and that was a result of the French-Indian War, and uh, the Americans and colonists to the south not trusting the French and telling them to GTFO a as soon as possible. And so what we saw, uh, well we didn't see it but it's recorded and it's remembered, is people coming up as refugees. That's, that's real. Then the American Civil War happens. And so right now a popular thing, especially with liberal um, groups, is looking at the loyalists as refugees. When in essence they had more going for them than the Acadians. So a marginalized group that intermarries and starts developing with the indigenous populations uh, from the Passamaquoddy to the Abenaki to the Mi'kmaq to the Wolastikik have a system. But then people with more capital show up. So economically they're a powerhouse. They show up and they come in. And that's representative of the history of the province. And then there's more that goes on from there. But then we go way now to the 1960s and we see more growth, more dependence on the repatriation of the Constitution, a new Canada comes up. And so the new Canada starts existing and new projects need to be developed. So there's massive land claims issues, massive developments of systems and enfranchisement or disenfranchisement, who gets to vote, who gets to represent this, new intersectionality. That is decided by people who shouldn't be deciding that because they showed up and they had the most influence. We're finally at a point where that influence is being challenged, where it is representative of the democratic process in the sense that people elected a diverse group to speak on multiple issues. But there's still voices missing. So in aspect, it's good. But we still haven't challenged it enough to really see success for everyone who's being hit by it. Um, the budget's supposed to come out soon. Uh, there's going to be more legislation happening in some aspect, but the cabinet's all slanted one way. These people will fight tooth and nail for their issues if they're the People's Alliance, who in rhetoric are calling themselves, you're with us, you're a person of New Brunswick, which is such a dysfunctional title because in a sense what it's challenging is that we are the peoples of New Brunswick. We're in an alliance, and anything against us is not people's nor part of the alliance. So challenge the Purple Party regardless. The Greens, who fought tooth and nail just to be recognized as legitimate in a Coke and Pepsi province that's been so much like that forever that it's become a fundamental problem of our identity, a shared identity that we all have to deal with, regardless of what aspects you represent. You buy something in this province. You're now part of the Coke and Pepsi province. Welcome to Canada. Uh, welcome to New Brunswick. So we're at a good point to challenge and struggle, but that contention can easily be diffused and turned into someone's monoculture of how we fix the province. Now vote for us again. That's not fair. That's not what people voted for. But that's where we're going. And I bet you five bucks. That's what we see. Just five. <laughs> I, I'm a student. Eh? I'm a student. That's all I got. I swear. Deal. Well, you don't have to bet anything, Jared. Yeah. Um, 
This makes me think of, uh, in the Facebook world today, um, Jeremy Dutcher made a pretty powerful speech at the Junos on Sunday, which were last night. And there's a key piece in there that I thought we should bring into the present because it tied to how you laid out the political landscape from your perspective, is that nation to nation conversations and decision making. And Mr. Dutcher was very poignant and pointed with how he framed that up all in a minute and a half, two minutes, which was quite artistic, actually, because that's what the man is. Um, do you want to play with that a little bit? Because somewhere in that space is a potential for a breakthrough in how the decision-making process um, unfolds and that feeling of togetherness rather than the disparity that um, you just kind of mapped out. We need to get on with a new way of doing things. Do the artists have a sense of what that path looks like? Does First Nations have a sense of what that path looks like? Can we get the rest of the other cultures to tap into that power? Well, I think especially the artists uh, in the First Nations cultures. I hate to pan-Indian it, though, because there's a big generalization. There's a lot of policies. There's bad policies that well, exist. We could strip it right down to he spoke from the heart. Exactly. And it, and it doesn't matter what culture you're from. He's speaking from the heart. Well, he spoke from his heart, and it matters what culture he's from. He's from the Wolastukic, who were marginalized so much so that they were called the Maliseet, which was an appropriation and a justified appropriation by the Canadian government to take away someone's identity. So New Brunswick does that really well, especially with a national park called Kushbogwak, where they've taken a Mi'kmaq word, meaning uh, estuary, essentially where ocean meets river, to justify a national park that makes very little profit for the peoples it's justifying its existence on. And when I've been there, they've got these huge posters of uh, World War I veterans and women everywhere that have nothing to do with the land but the identity. So what we've done is we've justified our identity too long rather than considering its impacts. Jeremy Dutcher, as a Woolastukic, uh artist has represented his culture. He's done great, he's done amazing things, and he's gonna keep fighting for that. And his voice has been heard, and it's gonna keep being heard because it hits, it's important. The reason it's important though is because of that marginalization and that disconnect. So when he speaks from his heart, it's a Woolastukic heart, and it's a damn proud one. And that's important, so it deserves to be heard. And that's the thing to consider, is there is solutions, but that's only because it's been problematized. And when a group is problematized, that's the most inhuman thing you can do to them. It's turning them into an other who lives down the street in the reserve and you're not going to go there. It creates a problem that won't be solved. And when, it's, when people look for solutions, that's when bad things start happening. When people get that solution mindset. No, I'm, I'm not getting at like solving the original disconnect. I'm saying when someone's got a problem person and they look for a solution how to deal with that person, that's ghettoization that's isolation and that tends to be when the worst of the worst comes out in human beings. To step away from that you have to look at the problem within and that's what you recognize as a person, what you recognize inside a person's experience. So that's the real problem and I know that can get scary. No, this is wonderful because this is an example of the new explanation basically. It's, it's the two things unfolding at the same time. <clears throat> there needs, in general terms, there needs to be a breakthrough in our political conversation. And that's how we started down this path. <clears throat> and I wanted to see if Mr. Dutcher's offering of where the solutions were, because he talked about a different conversation and more storytelling. We need to do more things together. Um, is that the direction to go, given that New Brunswick has a minority government for the first time in 100 years? And is it loosened up enough that there's a window here, if we can seize it, to have a different conversation, not in its topics, but a different conversation in its process. As long as we recognize everyone who's involved and appreciate how they're involved. And what I mean by that is there's a big disconnect with, uh, so Indian Act chiefs versus traditional chiefs, what we've seen out west especially is uh, there's a development of a culture uh, based on what they've been permitted to do after being, after being put into residential schools, being isolated, uh, being lied to in treaties, being ghettoized, and uh, just, it, it's, it's a lot to just break down all that because it's really painful. It's, it's, a sh it's, it's too much, but it's not appreciated. Instead, it's apologized for and then swept under the rug. So and not true healing then? Not true healing, not true healing at all because it's not all coming out in a circle and those responsible most of them are dead. You can't do much, but the generations that have lived through it are still living. 
and they're living in a world that's only informed as much as they're permitted to be informed by because there's been laws that have literally killed culture there's been language that's been devastated there's been genocidal acts that aren't appreciated there's been a disconnect with the general public that is just permitted and true healing from that is from storytelling it's from listening it's from permitting oneself to compromise it's from permitting oneself to entertain another to have a dinner, to sit in a circle, to listen to music, to read a book. But what we've also seen historically is there's a division of powers between the province and the government of Canada. And the government of Canada keeps propagating those vicious disconnects. And the province can stay no. It was a fundamental development in the repatriation of the Constitution uh, that the notwithstanding clause permits a lot of not... Uh, if consent's not given, you can't do it. Quebec's been really good at that, and they've gotten a lot of flack for that. But they're still Quebec, and that's fair. And that means they've been able to develop from that. But that hasn't been used in New Brunswick because there's a lot of political stuff on it. So yeah, it's good that we have a minority diverse government that's totally divested. There's one deciding seat in that government right now, and that's amazing. The fact that it's 23, 22, 3, 3. That's beautiful. That means it's more representational of different opinions. But those different opinions have very staunch opinions, and how willing those people are to listen depends on them. So if someone has a minister that they've elected, then you make sure that they're damn accountable. You listen to what they're saying and how they're going to move. What we're not seeing is accountable ministers, especially from the PCs. They're literally ghosts because they're all afraid of representing a re-election attempt. That speaks to a value set that gets into being in power as opposed to being in governance. So, I, <clears throat> so could it be, because we were aiming mainly at the politicians or the elected officials, um, could it be that there also needs to be a shift amongst the voters, that they will vote for someone based on their faithfulness to a process as opposed to their commitment to an outcome? Well, what I would, and this is dangerous territory because expectations of people aren't always fair. I'm not the most, I don't know why someone votes for what they vote for, and I would never tell them how to vote because that's not my place. Mm -hmm. What I represent is my heart and my family and my life. And so when people need to challenge things, it's because you're asking them to be aware of something. And if we want educated voters, we need a good education system. And if we need a good education system, then the legislature has to be there to support the education system. That means that the unions that are in, the interest groups that control the education system need to have some satisfaction. So there's a lot of these invisible thresholds that have to be met in order to get change going. So we've seen it in so many fundamental issues is from busing to language to books to materials to snow days uh, everything's being challenged but that's the responsibility and that responsibility needs to be a conventional system something that goes beyond the politicians beyond everyone but is consensual it has to be a rule of the province that's been developed by the people of the province for the province in essence what you're doing and what i would see as the best best way to diffuse this disconnect and really create a new understanding of all the damage that's been done is to establish connections from community to community, especially the reservations, and then especially with non-status Indians, because, and I use Indians because that's literally the term that's been developed under the Indian Act, is there's this almost invisible wall right now between status on reserve off-reserve non-status and how those four aspects of identity all compete with each other and develop based on a bad policy. So when you've created that bad policy, the way to diffuse it is you look at all the groups and you ask for representatives of those groups to come in and you listen. A fundamental value that should be developed, especially in a post-colonial society, is listening to Aboriginal leaders, is to compromising, inviting, and developing frameworks with them a new standard of care that is more informed and more developed based on a fundamental right you can't argue with. A right for the people that cannot be challenged by people manipulating people. So you can't go in one day and say, no, get the Indians out of Parliament. And that's not fair. That would be wrong. But they've never been let in. So that's what I'm getting at. Yep. I lived through a military life. I grew up in Armacto, and it's a great place to grow up for some people. 
Uh, CFB Gagetown is the most hardest working fundamental part of New Brunswick, I would argue, because that community is so streamlined and everyone is there to sacrifice every day and soldier on. And that's amazing. But then again, that's my personal investment in that group. There's people from Dalhousie that have been fighting tooth and nail just to sustain themselves. There's people from St. John that are so industry, that's all they got. There's people from uh, Woodstock that are lumberjacks to, to the day they die. But then there's kids growing up in these places and they need something that supports them beyond their community. They need their communities and those communities have to be respected. But then you've got to deal with the fact that these communities are limited. So you go to Oromocto and it's small. I'm talking Oromocto Reserve now, First Nations, well, Muktuk, and it's getting smaller. But it's still, it's not getting smaller by land size, it's just trying to manage those resources. Then you go to St. Mary's, then you go to Kings Clear. And the fact that those are different communities and being treated differently than other communities, like, that's the whole reserve versus non-reserve land. That's wrong. That's always been wrong. But it won't be challenged because fundamentally, no one wants to go to legislature um, and say, we're all idiots and it's time to change that. Because then they're risking, first off, starting a big debate that's going to delegate and then govern the idea furthermore. But it's not going to be the people who should be governing it, governing it. Thank you for that. It frames up a gap. I like using the phrase gaps because it's where creation happens, you know, the space between two things. Um, what you just mapped out was very clear in terms of what was missing, which was the connection between all these parts into a creative process, into what are, what are the, what's the path we're going to take in the future that doesn't ideally or romantically resolve all these things, but it does give us a sense of us. Because what you just mapped out was sort of a dysfunctional definition of us. We don't have a sense of us, a province, where we're all actually taking a step in the same direction, more or less in the same time, that sense of movement. Um, smaller units like a community or a team or an orchestra, they'll have a sense of who they are, their collective identity. Maybe there's a window that's open for the next 10 years or so with a minority government, with uh, more social media and that kind of instant communication, assuming it's authentic, assuming it's heart heartfelt, yeah. that maybe we don't have the answer to that question yet, what are the solutions? Because we're still in that formulation stage of, but who are we? And aside from constantly defining the problem or doing more research, because we have a habit of deflecting the solution by going and doing more research, especially in a four-year election cycle. That happens a lot. Is there something we can do that actually gets people to doing that shift that we can almost kind of see the glimmers or the edges of that doesn't even involve politics? A community can just get on with making their community a better place. I don't, I represent one aspect of community, but I've also been disconnected from that because that's what happens in my community. And no matter what, I'm going to be chained to this province from my family, my history, my dedication to it. But that's the thing is we're all chained together and we have to learn how to move. So it's not left at the same time. It's like no. you have to move both out legs, then inside, outside, inside, something yeah. like that. Or, or it's just a general direction that we agree to is a sense of achieving consensus as opposed to a power. It's in consent. <clears throat> and to get consensus and consent, you need accurate, informed, and accredited, not accredited, let's drop that one, but accurate and informed people. So they know what they're talking about accurately. They're informed about things they don't understand. And that's the outside inside concept is you need a good circle of understanding of everything influencing and going on outside of your own bubble. But then you have to really rep uh, represent and respect your inside community. And to better that, it's a fundamental issue of resources, what you need, what other people have. So you need a more tangible problem for me to really get into it. But the thing is, I'm 19. I am a student and I'm already more engaged into this process than most politicians are because I've acknowledged that there's an outside community. I've had to fight to appreciate the outside community that's connected to me. Because coming from an abusive household, in a military town, fundamentally what I had to deal with was my abuser was the most appreciated person in the household. Just that was a fundamental. So how could I challenge someone? How could I really 
and I'm trying to I'm trying to stay logical about this even though it is a, it's a heavy emotional topic so I'll just need a second but how could I as a human being challenge something when I had so much faith in it when I had someone who was representative of everything because they had the most merit because they were the believed in system how could I challenge that so I didn't and I had And I lived through a lot to get there. So that had to be done with a good informed support network outside of the household. Even though everyone in the household was suffering and had to go through so much, I had to appreciate what they were going through and I lost people because of that. I lost my sister and my older brother. Mm -hmm. And I was forced into systems I didn't have consent in or really could appreciate everything was going on because it was so streamlined as a process. We can't do that as the way to diffuse everything. We need an informed process. We need a shared process. We need to sit down and listen. We need representatives of multiple groups to come into a space and share it, to make that hard-hitting, dedicated compromise as the first step towards something else. And that's what communities need to do. Working at the food banks, I was able to work with other food banks who are just scraping by. And the way it's done is food would come to a space that was donated and then they'd be on pallets and you would cut the pallets open and you have to fundamentally distribute it and that was great but what developed in that system is I worked for someone who was a pragmatic racist belligerent person who decided to start using theology and other stuff to direct conversation so it created all these other systems of merit to justify why I know it's very confusing but I would drive around with this man and he was even my real boss he was just a representative of the group that was given this task and the reason I bring this up is when someone has a task that they get to control independently and direct it turns into Duncan Campbell Scott where you get someone who's going to develop a framework based on their theocracy and their misinformed philosophy so I'm working for this man and over the period of the summer, I couldn't fight it. But I was given that one out at the end where I could talk to the board that controls the food bank and represent everything. And they were very informed people, very caring people, and they listened. And so something was done about it. And that's great. But fundamentally, that space was pulled out. And when that thing was pulled out of the food bank, it caved. Not caved, it's still there and they are yeah. great people working. But that tension bounced back is there was space that was once supported, even though it was supported by a bad person, not even a bad, a good person with bad intentions, bad information was stealing things, just, yep. anyways. So when that pillar's removed, you're expecting the, or everything to cave in, but it didn't. And they sustained themselves when they were afraid to. It's the exact same thing when my mother had to deal with leaving an abusive partner who kept belligerently coming back and assaulting her is, there has to be dedication, but there also has to be a safety. Mm -hmm. So it's a tricky system to develop, but it has to be an informed one. And what that means is politicians can't be the ones to develop the framework independently. The province can't be led by the feds either, though, because the federal standards aren't the fairest most of the time. That's what we've seen is there's a lot of heavy powers there that get to direct things. It's the same in the province though. So what that means is the framework has to go back to the people it's affecting. It has to be a decision developed by them, but that means they have to come together. And there's a big disconnect between chiefs, between the Indian Act chiefs versus traditional chiefs, between different reserve chiefs, different reserves, different groups, because they're under a racist formed Indian Act. The whole concept is still used even though it's fundamentally challenged so it goes back to being a university student is we all know what's going on we're all engaged but we're so worried about meeting deadlines and this idea of GPA and a merit at the end of it yep. that we don't really entertain engagement to diffusing conflict and a new understanding of each other yep. it's beautiful <laughs> the uh, and as I listen to you share your journey and your path it's Looming on the horizon, and it's like right there, is this notion of joy or of um, collective conscience, to use some of the soul work uh, language, you know, how we come together as, as a group and an entity. And in your speech is really powerful at this time because it speaks to the dissolution or the dissolving phase, which is necessary to get on with where the new thing can emerge from. 
but that's the trick too is some of these things already have sustainability uh like recently i had to entertain this great convergence of all um aspects of my life by going into and that's a really great thing in journalism and why i look forward to the work i can do is because you have to do that you have to deal with convergences uh and that's when the gaps are pushed together and they fill they build like this wall or a structure that's going to start moving one way or another. And when that structure starts moving, there's always people that are going to get steamrolled. And historically, that's been indigenous women. Historically, that's been the Acadians. Historically, that's been people of color. Historically, that's been, and sorry, people of color is too general. I'm talking about the black loyalists, Africville. Yep. Uh, there's a history, especially in the Maritimes, of new structures being built, people picking sides and then going with it. And just to make a grand uh, inclusion of the broad culture around us is when an outsider comes in and they get to really dedicate themselves to the space, they get to enjoy it. But they only enjoy aspects that they're being sensitized to. And they're being judged for that by the circle they're stepping into. And that's tricky because it's not fair most of the time. And it's taken personally because there's someone that's going through something that the outsider doesn't understand. So the outsider has a responsibility to listen all the way around. But everyone's speaking has to acknowledge that the outsider comes from something they don't understand either. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have about two, three minutes left. You've taken us on a wonderful journey. Um, how would you like to wrap this up? Final thoughts? Oh, there's no final <laughs> thoughts yet. I'm looking forward to working with the Dennis Report and getting as much content created for this province we care about. Uh, I appreciate the respect today and the acknowledgement of some very heavy issues and not really pushing that. This mindfulness is needed. Yeah. Uh, I you, you did a lovely job of showing us the deep connection between a personal journey and then the shared journey with society and community. And it's an invitation for everyone watching that somewhere in your own journey you're going to be doing something similar in order for us collectively to get over certain thresholds in order to come together again as a community. Yeah. And that's tricky because there's a lot of things that hold that back. And so hopefully finding them out, calling them, making fun of them, enjoying them, appreciating them, respecting them, all aspects of what everything it is and dissolving it and letting it go is going to be a big thing. Yeah. But it's a feasible, doable thing. Thank you. Thank you. Check it. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for watching. As always, be good, have fun, and love each other. Not too much, though. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.